welcome back to Combat Mission Battle for Normandy for the 10th mission of the Road to Monteberg campaign. In the last mission, the 325th Glider Infantry Regiment kicked in the German defence west of Magnaville, allowing the 505th Parachute Infantry Regiment to exploit. The 1st Battalion is heading on to Monteberg Station, but we're hooking left with Dog and Easy Companies of 2nd Battalion to kick the Germans off a chunk of high ground between the station and La Ham. More specifically, we're attacking across the railway line towards Too Farm, the Massage, and another Le Goulet, which is completely different to the Le Goulet from the last mission. The farms are both worth 50 points, but there are 200 points on offer for destroying enemy forces, so I'm more concerned with finding and destroying the defenders in this one than I am with land grabbing. After all, if there's no one left to defend the ground, then it's mine by default. We last saw Dog and Easy Companies at Le Licone back in Mission 6, and while they have suffered a few casualties here and there, they're essentially intact and in marked contrast to the glider infantry, they have plenty of short-ranged firepower and, critically, each airborne squad has a couple of demolition charges for blasting through hedgerows with. Easy Company has had a single 81mm mortar assigned to it, and I have a two-tube section of 81s on call as well, along with a battery of four 75mm pack howitzers. Similar to Hell in the Hedroads though, my infantry is on its own, there's no armour or cavalry tagging along. So far so good, everything is relatively familiar. Things start to diverge a little from the previous missions when we get to the terrain though. The big difference is that for the first time, the field system is mostly marked out by low bocage instead of tall bocage. So while the field boundaries are just as much of a physical obstacle to movement, they are considerably less of an obstacle to observation and fire. This is a significantly different tactical scenario to the toll bocage maps that have been the rule so far. I'm not going to be able to keep my pixel truppen out of harm's way by hiding them behind hedgerows. To mitigate this and decrease the effectiveness of the enemy's likely advantage in long-range firepower is our old friend the weather. Not only is it still raining, but conditions are misty and the time is 21.05, so it's going to get darker as the game goes on. The map is pretty much flat up to the railway line, after which it starts to slope upwards towards the two farms. I'm going to have to cross the railway at some point, and the best place for doing this is probably going to be in the woods on the left, where I can at least take advantage of some concealment. Also over on the left, in the bottom corner, there is some standing water. It has been raining all day and the runoff has caused some localised flooding. My pixel trippin can wade through this water, but it will slow them down and make them easy targets for anyone unsporting enough to be shooting at them. On the other side of the railway line, we have another strip of woodland on the left, followed by an orchard, the ominous quadrangle. Anyone who studied military history should know that any terrain features with angle in the name are bad news, and the farm of Le Massange. Beyond Le Massange, are a few more fields and then Le Goulet. You may have noticed that I've been saying left a lot and not really been mentioning the right flank. This is because I'm already not very interested in attacking over on that side. It's pretty obvious that the left has more concealment and that I'm going to reach one of the objectives faster, but less obvious is the way the ground lends itself to the way I want to fight. The briefing indicates that the enemy defenders are in reduced company strength. For simplicity's sake and to explain this concept, let's call that three platoons. He has to spread his three platoons out to cover all of my options. He doesn't know where I'm going to attack from. So let's be sensible and put one platoon in each objective and then put the last one in the woods near the railway line to cover the most obvious avenue of approach. If I go right, and attack across these open fields, then the platoon in the wood can shoot at me, the platoon in Le Massage can shoot at me, and the platoon up at Le Goulet can shoot at me. On this flank, these three enemy positions will be mutually supporting. If I move against one, the others can contribute to its defence. I'd be fighting the entire enemy force at once. If I go left though, the ground blocks line of sight between the enemy positions meaning that it can't support each other and I can fight one platoon at a time, crushing it with overwhelming force before moving on to the next. This is an oversimplification, it's based on an educated guess on how the enemy defence could be set up, but you get the idea. 
the left hand of avenue of approach splits the defense up. The right hand approach unites it. So the plan is to go left. As usual, there are disadvantages to going this way. Despite hopefully only engaging comparatively small chunks of the defense at once, I'm still attacking into some defender-friendly terrain. First I have to go through a wood, where I can expect to be ambushed quite easily, and after that I have to slog up a slope towards Le Massange. But because I know I'm going to be attacked here, I can work these areas into the fire plan for my preparatory bombardment. After all, on top of the usual time issues of calling for artillery during a relatively short game, it's 9 o'clock at night, the sun is setting, and the increasing darkness compared with the weather conditions will extend the spotting phase even more. I'm simply not going to have time to call the artillery in once the game has started. So I'm going to hit the crest of Le Massage with the 75s, smack the woods beyond the railway line with the off-map 81s, and use my single on-map medium mortar to put rounds into the quadrangle. It all makes a noisy backdrop as the airborne move out. This is all very standard and should be pretty familiar by now, scouts out in front, split down squads moving forward with plenty of overwatch on standby. By the time the lead elements reach the railway line, the fire mission on the woods has finished, and I'm not at risk of any errant mortar bombs hitting my own troops. I am at risk, however, of misjudging the terrain. With a fair number of pixel truppen up on the low bocage lining my side of the railway, it's time to send a team across under their watchful eyes. The actual railway crossing is the last place that I would want to use. It's simply too obvious and bound to be covered, so I order one of the BAR teams to squeeze through this gap in the bocage. Unfortunately, it's not a gap in the bocage, or at least not one the game considers passable. And of course, I place these orders at the start of the turn, and I can only watch as my brave little idiots pathfind their way straight up the bocage line to the crossing. They are doing exactly what they've been told to do, just not in the way they were intended to do it. An MP40 lights them up, and the BAR gunner goes down. The fire looks like it comes from the corner of the field at the edge of the woods, and this would make sense. That's a pretty good defilade position. If I can't breach the vacage, then I have to come at it head on across the crossing, and I don't have a lot of space or depth to build up a base of fire. But I don't have to come at it straight on. Unlike the unfortunate glider infantry from the last mission, all of my squads have demolition charges, and I can quite happily blast my way through the vacage on the railway line and pass troops into the woods on the other side to get on the Germans' flank. While they're doing that, I have another squad area firing the enemy position. This gets some results of a few enemy pixel trip and try to escape up the slope, but judging from that contact's icon, there are still some holding out. It would be nice to get one of the 60mm mortars onto them, but my light mortars on that flank are a little behind my infantry and their line of sight is blocked by the wood. It'll take a while for one of them to get into position. The other flank is a different story. Focusing on the left doesn't mean I'm going to ignore the right completely. I've been moving a platoon up through the fields so that I can not only have the option to spread my attack out, but to perform that all-critical reconnaissance function. The logic that the right is exposed to all the enemy positions on the left still stands, but this cuts both ways. Drawing fire has a good chance of revealing any enemies on the other flank, and while the distance is long enough to mitigate the effectiveness of any incoming fire, provided I keep my squad split, it's not going to stop my troops spotting muzzle flashes in the dying light. Drawing fire over here will help to reveal the extent and layout of the enemy defence up at Le Massage, and once I have targets, I can also bring a few light mortars to bear. This is more difficult than it sounds. My lead mortar team comes in the fire from an MG42 just across the railway, and has to go to ground before it can send any mortar bombs over to the left. By the time the German MG has been dealt with, the darkness has closed in, and my mortar can no longer draw a line of sight. It was worth a try, but the time has passed. Despite putting up some resistance and making sure he's got his hand grenades out, the German squad leader on the corner finally goes down to a 60mm bomb, and I can start pushing up. Time and again in these games, it feels like it's not the bulk of the enemy force that's the problem, it's the diehards and bitter enders fighting to the death that are the sticking points. While I mass troops at the bottom of the hill prior to attacking upslope towards the Massange, I need to check out the far left. The quadrangle still seems ominous, 
So I have the lone survivor of the crossing BAR team fire on it from the inundated fields next to the wood. This is a calculated risk. It's getting dark enough to start playing spot by muzzle flash. My lone pixel trupper isn't likely to hit anything, but the idea is to reveal his position to any enemy units up there to see if they respond. And they do. There's an MG42 in the field next to the quadrangle which opens up on him. This in turn provokes a couple of my teams to return fire. Engagements at night tend to have this kind of snowball effect. Firefights rapidly expand as firing units quickly give their positions away. The MG42 gets the better of it, taking out two of my airborne in the swampy ground before I can get my light mortars online and smother it with 60 million bombs. This sets the pattern for the engagements that erupt across the top of the ridge as I push up a few turns later. My pixel tripper moving forward through the orchard and the wheat field on its right gets spotted, come under fire and take casualties. I return fire with small arms and mortars, win some measure of fire superiority, then close up to the enemy positions to chase them off, kill them or take them prisoner. I'm not mishandling my troops in a way that's going to cause me to lose these engagements. The question is how much time and manpower I lose in the process. The enemy already has an advantage because he's defending. Night fighting lends him a major boost by allowing him to almost always get the first shot off. The first turn of contact is the one where I'm losing men. In every turn after finding an enemy position, the balance tilts further and further in my favour as I bring my superior combat powers to bear. Over on the right, I can at least exploit the darkness somewhat. As well as contributing some light mortar fire to the attack on the Massange, I've been pushing forward. After all, if it's too dark for me to spot the enemy from over here, then it's going to be difficult for him to spot me too, and I can make the most of that by advancing with an eye to coordinating a flanking attack on Legule with the planned assault from my troops at the Massage once that objective has been taken. There are Germans over here as well though. Good news in the bigger picture because it means the enemy has diluted his defence, but bad news for my airborne in the wood on the right as they come under fire, first from rifle grenades and then from some kind of anti-tank or infantry gun in depth. Again though, we see the same formula, initial casualties, application of firepower, both from light mortars, squad small arms and light machine guns, followed by an assault element closing with and destroying the enemy. This is somewhat complicated by the presence of the enemy gun in the rear and several mortar spotting rounds which cause me to rapidly disperse my troops to avoid getting caught in a fire mission, but the end result is the same and I can start probing through this enemy position towards the flank of Legule. Events over at Le Messange have panned out well in the meantime. Casualties are inevitable but ultimately light as the remnants of the German defence crumbles away. By now I've moved another platoon. Lieutenant Turnbull's platoon, in fact, up through the quadrangle and onto the left flank of the occupied Lemassange buildings, where they can cover further probes into the fields on the way to Legule. Our lone survivor from the BAR team is up again. Given that my lead elements are almost always getting a bloody nose when they encounter the enemy, sending a single man translates into fewer casualties than sending a team. He stumbles onto a small group of German pixel troopers who have fled Le Massange and has himself a little rampage. This comes to an end after a close call with a hand grenade. But the sole German who escaped his wrath throws in the towel next turn and is taken prisoner as I move up. Despite this, the battlefield has become very quiet. Just to the right of the Massange, my troops spotted HMG 42 and some foxholes, but the Germans flee into the night before I can bring any forces to bear on them. 
I'm able to move up across the board, essentially unmolested, apart from some more runners from the massage cowering in a wheat field who get their hits in before they're inevitably overwhelmed. That is, in fact, the last contact of the battle, though I don't know it yet. Expecting further resistance all the way to Ligule, I slowly and steadily move up, stopping every now and again for speculative area fire, hoping to lure some Germans to reveal their positions by engaging the muzzle flashes in front of them. But there's nothing, not even after occupying Ligule and moving to clear some of the barns and farmhouses. In the end, I let the game run out, which is somewhat annoying because there are four minutes of overtime, and the result is a major victory for the US. I've occupied both the ground objectives, kept my casualties down, and while I didn't get all the points for destroying the enemy, I got about half, which is good enough. I've lost 12 dead and 10 wounded, with a solid 250 still up and running. While I made a few mistakes here and there, overall I put most of these casualties down to the dangers of attacking at night. The enemy, on the other hand, have lost 22 dead, 15 wounded, and 4 taken prisoner. They have 54 men still alive, though, which begs the question, where the hell are they? The answer is, not on the map. There's only one German pixel weapon still hanging around in the end game, the lone survivor of a mangled fire team. Everybody else is gone. The only thing I can think of is that the enemy had an exit objective. After a certain point during the game, he's fallen back past Ligule to the edge of the map and withdrawn. Presumably the enemy aimed to fight a delaying action here rather than hold his ground and be destroyed. It's a little annoying. You might have to fight these Germans again sometime later in the campaign, but at least they get a good kicking and in the end, it's probably for the best that I didn't have to go through the inevitably casualty-heavy exercise of clearing out Ligule in the dark. Still. This mission is over and done with. Next up, we're back with the 325th Glider Infantry, who seem to have gotten the short straw in this campaign and have another very tough looking mission ahead of them. Until then, hope you guys enjoyed this video, and I'll see you in the next one.